Hello, and welcome to part three of the mini lecture series on the nervous tissues. And what we're going to look at in this lecture is going to be organization of the nervous system and organization of these neural tissues. Now, if we take a look at this, what we're going to have is either a central nervous system or a peripheral nervous system within the body. Uh, the central nervous system is going to be comprised of the brain and the spinal cord. And so what we're going to see is nervous tissues that are developing from the neural tube very early on in development. And so they're going to have a, a neural epithelial origin. Uh, so they're essentially going to form as a tube. Um, the spinal cord is going to remain as a tube. And the brain is going to undergo some uh, essentially enlargements and some kind of folding around, which is going to give it a, its unique kind of three-dimensional structure. But it's still based on that, that neural tube uh, formation. Now, what makes the central nervous system uh, important to recognize is that it's encased within a bony protective structure. And so uh, it's going to be very vital to the body. You need a functioning central nervous system uh, to have, you know, conscious control about what's going to be going on uh, within, your, within your body. And so we're going to have the brain, which is going to be sitting within the skull as a good, strong, protective mechanism around it. Uh, and we're going to have the vertebral column, uh, which is going to form a bony protective structure around the spinal cord. And then extending out from the central nervous system are going to be all of the peripheral nerves, which are going to go out and connect up the rest of the body uh, to the central nervous system. So peripheral nerves going out and carrying information to the muscles of the body, as well as carrying sensory information uh, back towards the brain and the spinal cord. Now, if we take a look at how the central nervous system is organized, it's going to be comprised of either gray matter or white matter. Gray matter of the central nervous system, or CNS, is going to be the location of the neuronal cell bodies. And so this is where we find the soma, the perikaryon, so the cell bodies. We're going to have some axons that are present, probably a, a fair number of dendrites, as well as all of the glia, or many of the glial cells that we've talked about. And so what we're going to see is that the gray matter is going to be the location for synapses. And so we're going to have lots and lots of dendritic branches. They're going to be extending out throughout the gray matter, receiving signals, carrying that information to the cell bodies. And then in many cases, the cell body will make a decision about whether or not to send that information on. And it'll go out through an axon, but it may go to a great distance within the body. So it may go into the white matter, which we'll take a look at on the next slide. But essentially, the, the receiving of signals, the processing of signals, is going to be occurring within the gray matter of the central nervous system. Now, if we take a look at where the gray matter is going to be located within the spinal cord, that's relatively easy. Because what we can see is that it's going to be at the core of the spinal cord. Uh, but if we take a look at the brain, it becomes a little bit more complicated because of the, the growth of the brain during development because of the folds uh, that we talked about, kind of the enlargement and the kind of twisting around, uh, it's going to look very different. And so what we can say is that in general, it's going to form the outer cover of the brain as well as distinct regions that are deeper within the brain. But again, in all cases, it's going to be the location where we're going to have the cell bodies and the location of the, the synapses. The white matter of the central nervous system, or CNS, is going to be prized uh, composed primarily of axon tracts. And so it's going to have that white appearance because of the, the myelin uh, that's going to be present surrounding and supporting all of these axons. And so within the, the white matter, we're going to have axons which are essentially going to be carrying the information from the cell bodies in the gray matter at some location, either within the brain or the, the core of the spinal cord, out to a target location. It may be nerve cells in another region uh, within the central nervous system, or they may extend out and go out into the periphery. And if they extend out beyond the central nervous system, they'll actually go into uh, a peripheral nerve. Uh, but essentially, what we've got with the white matter is going to be axons, um, in many cases, axon tracts, which are carrying uh, information from one location to another location within the central nervous system. And so in a tract, we're going to have many axons representing many different cells that are carrying similar information from one location to another. Keep in mind that 
as we had in the gray matter. In the white matter, we're also going to have associated glial cells, uh, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, uh, blood vessels. They're going to be involved with uh, establishing the environment uh, that keeps these uh, axons, these uh, cell extensions, uh, alive and functioning. Now, as we said, the peripheral nervous system is going to be the nervous tissues that are outside of the brain or the spinal cord. And so it's going to be those extensions that go out from that bony protective mechanism. So if the brain, it's going to be extending out through the, the skull and going out to, say, the muscles of the faces or sensory organs uh, within uh, the head. Or it could be, if we're looking at the spinal cord, process that are coming out going beyond the vertebral column and then making connections with either sensory receptors or muscles out in the periphery of the body. And so if we take a look at the peripheral nervous system, uh, again, it has two primary functions. Uh, it could be a motor component where we're going to have axons going out, uh, synapsing on muscle cells and in doing so controlling muscle activity. Or we could have uh, sensory uh, cells, sensory neurons. Um, and in this case, the sensory processes are going to be going and either ending up in free nerve endings within the periphery or interacting with special sensory receptors. And they're going to carry information, collect and carry information about what's going on in the body, in the kind of surrounding world, back towards the nervous system. And so that's primarily what we're going to have within the peripheral nervous system. There are going to be a few locations where we're going to have ganglia within the peripheral nervous system. And the ganglia are going to be peripheral clusters of neuronal cell bodies. And so most of the cell bodies within the nervous system are going to be located with either the brain or the spinal cord. But in some specific areas, specific functional regions, we're going to see clusters of nerve cell bodies outside of this, outside of the brain or the spinal cord. And they're going to be referred to as ganglia. Now, the classic example of this <clears throat> of these peripheral nervous system ganglia uh, are going to be the craniospinal ganglia. Uh, the craniospinal ganglia are going to be either the ganglia of the, the cranial nerves or more commonly what's talked about in, in books are going to be the dorsal root ganglia and so the sensory ganglia that are sitting outside of the spinal cord. There are also going to be ganglia associated with the autonomic nervous system and so autonomic ganglia are going to be either your sympathetic ganglia or your parasympathetic ganglia. And so on this diagram on the right hand portion of the slide, we've got uh, kind of a photo montage, a couple of photos that have been kind of put together like mm -hmm. jigsaw puzzle pieces, where you can see the, the larger spinal cord towards the right, and then a, a, what would be a dorsal root coming off uh, of the spinal cord, and then going into this cluster, uh, kind of at the left hand portion of that, that series of images, where we're going to have cell bodies. If you look in very close detail, you can see the larger cells that are going to be present there. And so what we're going to have is going to be the dorsal root ganglia at that point, a, a structure that's outside uh, of the spinal cord. We take a look at that slide in, in a lot higher detail. Again, looking at the dorsal root ganglia as an example of the craniospinal ganglia, what we can see are those classic neuronal cells, relatively large cells, very euchromatic nucleus with a distinct nucleolus. And so we can see a large cell, that kind of palestating region towards the center, which is going to be the euchromatic nucleus. And then within that, the very dark staining nucleolus. And so if we take a look at this, the craniospinal ganglia, the dorsal root ganglia, uh, are going to be sensory. And they're going to be carrying sensory information from the periphery past these cells and into the spinal cord. And so if we take a look at this dorsal root ganglia, uh, what we can see is that uh, the cells are going to be concentrated near the periphery of the ganglion, uh, and we're going to have a good amount of uh, connective tissue as a capsule, which is going to be surrounding it. And so we've got this distinct structural arrangement in which we can find these neurons. Again, the neurons, the sensory neurons, are, are going to be large spheric nuclei, uh, euchromatic nuclei, distinct nucleolus, and relatively centrally placed uh, within the cell body. Again, we can see axons uh, that are coming off in the, the, the kind of left-hand portion of this slide, and we'll talk about axons later on, but again, those are going to be the processes that are coming off of these cells 
going out in either branching towards the periphery or branching towards uh, the spinal cord. Now if we take a look at, uh, again, a little bit higher detail, we can see a cluster of three neurons here at this point. Uh, we can see the nissel substance, uh, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and three polyribosomes uh, within the cytoplasm, very euchromatic nucleus, distinct nucleolus, relatively large cell, and then around that we can see some of the support cells. And within the ganglion, what we're going to be looking at are going to be satellite swan cells. And they're going to form about a one cell thick layer covering over the neuronal cell bodies within these craniospinal ganglia, so either the, the cranial nerve ganglia or the spinal uh, dorsal root ganglia. Uh, ganglia. Uh, and essentially surrounding and supporting them. And so we're going to identify them at this point based on their location. And within the dorsal root ganglia, we're going to have a pretty even layer of these satellite swan cells completely surrounding and supporting one of these nerve cells. They're going to be more disorganized and more scattered when we take a look at the uh, autonomic ganglia. And so the presence of these uh, satellite swan cells kind of evenly around uh, these neurons is an uh, identifying characteristic that we're looking at sensory neurons within the dorsal root ganglia. Now, if we take a look at the autonomic ganglia, what we're going to see is that it's, it's more randomly distributed, uh, more random than what we can see within the dorsal root ganglia. The dorsal root ganglia, we saw all of the nerve cells kind of clustered together. Within the autonomic ganglia, the cells are going to be scattered more throughout the ganglia. Uh, so we're going to have a few cells and then some neurons, or I'm sorry, some axons between them, and then some more neurons and then some more axons and a lot of things going on. Uh, we're still going to have relatively large neurons that are going to be present. Uh, the nuclei are going to still be euchromatic, uh, but they may be kind of pushed off to the side a little bit, so not as centrally located, so they're going to be referred to as eccentric. With the dorsal root ganglia, we had solely sensory neurons. With the autonomic ganglia, they generally are going to be mixed. Uh, we're going to have both sensory and motor cells that are going to be present within it. And this is going to be involved with sending impulses, sending information to a variety of targets within the body for primarily involuntary control. And so impulses to the smooth muscle uh, within the walls of organs, uh, impulses to regulate uh, the heart rate, so not causing the heart muscle to contract, but either to slow down or to speed up, as well as uh, going out to the glandular epithelium, controlling glandular secretions. Now within the autonomic nervous system, we're going to have two primary branches. Uh, the first are the sympathetic ganglia. The sympathetic ganglia are essentially going to have neuronal cell bodies close to the central nervous system within the sympathetic ganglia chain. Uh, and the sympathetic neurons are going to be involved with the fight or flight response. Uh, so they're essentially going to cause a release of adrenaline within the body. And they're going to have an overall effect of uh, priming the body to respond to some type of stress. So in general, they're going to cause vasodilation or an opening of blood vessels to the brain, the skeletal muscles, and cardiac muscles to deliver blood to areas of the body that need to be able to respond in a stressful situation. And in order to do that, they're going to vasoconstrict or regulate the blood flow to the digestive system. Now, the complement to the sympathetic ganglion are going to be the parasympathetic ganglion, parasympathetic uh, nervous system. What we're going to see here are that the parasympathetic ganglion neurons are going to have their cell bodies distributed more distant from the central nervous system. And the reason for that is that their cell bodies are often going to be within the peripheral organs themselves. And so we're going to find these cells within the walls of organs. And so they're going to lack the connective tissue. They're going to be more randomly, disorganized, or ra randomly distributed, but they're going to be involved with a normalizing function. They're going to be involved with the you can think about it as the rest and digest function. So vasoconstriction to uh, the brain, um, to the muscles, so that the blood flow can go to the digestive system and allow you to kind of finish up your meal, digest your meal, absorb the nutrients, and distribute those nutrients throughout the body. Uh, the reason for a nap after a nice large meal. Okay, that's going to finish up our mini lecture on organization of the nervous system. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.